Amen. Well, as you're seated this morning, I invite you to join me in John's Gospel, John chapter 20. The Gospel of John chapter 20. I want to thank you for being here this morning. I want to thank you for packing the house. So much so that we uh, have people in overflow in the fellowship hall, and I'm thankful. I want to thank you for giving up your seats this morning so that uh, some of our guests and friends and family could be here and be in the worship center this morning. Thank you for those that are joining us online, live. Thank you for those who will join us online later. We appreciate all of you. I want to ask you a question this morning, and it's a rhetorical question. I want you to think about it. What is the most significant event in human history? What is the most significant event in human history? I was curious about what people might say is the most significant event in human history, and so uh, I looked it up online, did a little research, and uh, found that Really, from a secular perspective, uh, people are going to say things like the Neolithic Revolution. Y'all remember that? Uh, The Neolithic Revolution is uh, what people refer to when they say that humans transitioned from hunter-gatherers to farmers. And so that revolution was changing and changed the dynamic of all of human history and so therefore it would be the most significant event in human history. Others would say things like uh, the end of the Roman Empire in AD 76 that that changed uh, the trajectory of human history and so that was a major event. Other people will point to things like the European Renaissance that happened in the 1300s and there were a lot of things that that came out of the European re- Renaissance. That's when things like eyeglasses and telescopes and microscopes and the printing press were invented. Uh, it's also a, a time of Uh, exploration and mapping and atlases became a thing during that time. It was a time of explosion when it comes to art and architecture and philosophy. And so some would say that uh, that Renaissance period was uh, the most significant event in human history. Uh, There are some of us this morning that are of a younger generation that would probably say, no, the most significant thing that ever happened in human history was the invention of the internet in the 1960s. That is what changed human history forever. But you know, there's no consensus among churchgoers either. There's a long list of possibilities when it comes to those who are familiar with the Word of God and saying what the most significant event in human history is. Some would say, well, the most significant event, event in human history was the creation of Adam and Eve. Without them, there would be no human history. And so surely that is the most significant event. From a Jewish perspective, you might say that it is the exodus. Israel's exodus from Egypt would be one of the most significant, if not the most significant event. And many believers would say that it is the birth of Jesus Christ. That the birth of Christ is the most significant event in human history. You know, it's interesting that the birth of Christ gets the most attention of all of our holy days on the Christian calendar. Yet, Scripture never commands or encourages us to commemorate it. In fact, our celebration of the birth of Christ is really based in tradition and secular commercialism. Others would say that it's the crucifixion of Jesus Christ that is the most significant event in human history. And the cross is the image of our faith. It's the means through which Jesus paid the price for our sins as the Passover lamb. But the crucifixion of Jesus would have no effect if he were still dead in the tomb. Now I tell you this morning that the most significant event in human history is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The thing that has changed human history and has the power to save souls and change lives is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The thing that makes all the difference in the world is that Jesus is alive forevermore. 
That is the most significant thing in human history. And today as we celebrate this event, we're going to learn how to rest in His resurrection. Resting in the resurrection of Jesus. You know, a couple of weeks ago we learned how to rest in the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's table. And we walk through uh, the, the way that we rest in those and the, the lessons that they teach. Last week on Palm Sunday, we learned to rest in the reign of King Jesus. And then as we fasted this past Tuesday evening to Wednesday evening, we learned to rest in His provision. And then on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, we broke the fast with a, what we called a sabbatic prayer service where we learned to rest in the person and the power and the purpose of the cross of Jesus Christ. Thursday night, we learned to rest in the Passover as we observed a Christian Seder service here in the fellowship hall. And all of this has led us up to this day where we can learn to rest in the resurrection. Resting in Jesus being risen from the grave. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was indeed crucified and He was buried. He was in the tomb during Passover, which is the 14th of Nisan according to Scripture. He, was, he remained in the tomb on the first day of unleavened bread, which is the 15th of Nisan in the Hebrew calendar, which makes the 16th of Nisan, the first day of the week, and it is the Feast of First Fruits. Notice that there are two Sabbaths back to back. The 14th is a regular Sabbath. It's the seventh day of the week, but it's also a high Sabbath because it is Passover. Scripture tells us that the very next day is the first day of unleavened bread, and it will be a Passover as well. And so you take our days of the week and just throw them right out the window because our solar calendar doesn't work on a Jewish calendar which is lunar based. And God says there are two Sabbaths. There's the Sabbath of the Passover, then there's the Sabbath of unleavened bread, and then the next day, whatever follows the Sabbath, is the first day of the week. It is the Feast of First Fruits, the 16th of Nisan, and it is on that day that Jesus became the first fruits. From the grave. In John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, the scripture records this Now, in the first day of the week, the 16th of Nisan, the the day of first fruits, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. We believe that that's John. John's writing the letter. He doesn't mention himself by name, but he acknowledges that God loved him. God loved them all. This is humble speak. This is not, this is not being prideful in what he's saying. He's, he's uh, basically not, he doesn't feel worthy to even mention his name. Just to simply say, I am the one whom Jesus loved, but he loved us all. And said to them, Mary said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. And the two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb and he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth which had been on his head not lying with the linen wrappings but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered and he saw and believed. Now there's a question we have to ask here, what did he believe? Because the very next verse says, For as yet they did not understand the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. Literally to the place where they were staying. They didn't live in Jerusalem, but they went away to the place where they were staying. They went away to their residence and they still didn't comprehend or understand these things. Jesus' followers were still restless and fearful. Now they would soon rest in His resurrection. And we can rest in His resurrection because of what has been accomplished through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so that's what I want to look at this morning. What has the Lord's resurrection accomplished for us? Brother Brian started preaching my sermon a little early this morning, but first we see that through His resurrection, Jesus did defeat death. He has defeated death. Look in verse 11. 
But Mary was standing outside the tomb, weeping, and so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When, they had, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. She's blinded by her grief. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the, to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that He had said these things to her. Now we know from the other gospel accounts that Mary is not at the tomb alone. That she did not come there alone, but she actually had other women who uh, were accompanying her. Uh, she, there were other women there. We see that in Mark's gospel, chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. The Sabbath was over. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? I need you to understand they weren't looking for the risen Lord. They were looking for a corpse. They were looking for a body. In fact, she says as much as that in John chapter 20 verse 2 when, when she said that they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have placed Him. We don't know where they put Him. She's saying that we didn't see the Lord's body. His body's not there. His corpse isn't there. He's, he, the, the tomb is empty and he, His body isn't in it. But look at what she says in verse 18. I have seen the Lord. She went there looking for a corpse. She went there looking for a body. She went there expecting to prepare his body even better for burial by placing spices on it. But she saw instead the Lord. Jesus defeated death in the grave. Luke tells us that the angel said more than what John records in John chapter 20. In Luke chapter 24... Verse, beginning in verse 5, it says, The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground when the angel spoke to them and said, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And the scripture says, And they remembered his words. They were seeking the living among the dead. Jesus has defeated death. And through His bodily death and resurrection, Jesus stripped the power from Satan who previously had the power over the grave. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 is talking about the fact that Jesus it was human. He was, he was here in the flesh and blood. It says, therefore, since the children, talking about humanity, share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. He has taken the power away from him. He defeated death. As Brother Brian said, he didn't just arrest it. He didn't just take it, take it captive. He defeated it. He conquered it. He did away with it. And so therefore, Satan bruised his heel on the cross, but Jesus crushed his head through the resurrection. 
It's the fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. The serpent deceived Eve and then Eve gave to her husband and he did eat. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when they did that, sin entered into humanity and we inherit that sin. All of us born in sin, of sin, to sin. No one had to teach you how to sin. It was natural to you. It comes easy. It, it's, it's what the heart desires. It's what the lust of the flesh wants. We go after it. And Jesus, or excuse me, the Father said to uh, Satan in that time, said to the serpent, he said, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. Speaking of the seed of Eve, the Messiah. Jesus Christ is the one whose heel was bruised on the cross of Calvary, but who crushed Satan when he defeated the grave, when he rose from death, and he is now alive forevermore. Here's what the resurrection has accomplished for us. It has defeated death. And through his resurrection, we are declared children of God. Look at verse 17 in John chapter 20. Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Now you can understand why she would want to cling to him and never let go. Because she thought all was lost. She thought that the Messiah was dead. She thought that Jesus was no more. And here he is standing in front of her alive. And so certainly she would want to cling to him. And certainly she would not want to let go. But he had work to do. And he had work for her to do. And so he says, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. The language he uses here is very significant. You probably wouldn't know this unless you've done, you, you do a word search or you look at this. But in John's Gospel, Jesus refers to God as the Father. 71 times. He refers to God as my father 27 times. But this is the only time in John's gospel that Jesus ever refers to God as the disciple's father. Go to my father and your father. Something has changed. Something has changed. And also up until this point in John's gospel, Jesus always referred to his disciples as friends. But now he calls them brothers. Something has changed. Through his resurrection, we are no longer separated from God. Through his resurrection, we are no longer dead in our iniquities and sin. Through his resurrection, we have received Life, but we also receive relationship. We who were once at enmity with God, rebelling against Him, have now been adopted into His family. God is our Father and Jesus is our brother. We have been declared children of God. Death has been defeated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ and we have been declared children of God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ and through His resurrection we are delivered from fear. In John chapter 20 beginning in verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Shalom, or in English, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Shalom, or in English, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Listen, the disciples were afraid. They were fearful. The one that they had followed had just been crucified by the authorities and it appears that those same authorities are now looking for them as well. They were locked up inside the upper room, fearful. The doors were shut. The, the, the image here is that they are locked, that they're barred for fear of the Jewish authorities. They felt abandoned and they were fearful for their own lives. You know, truly until the resurrection... Until the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all humanity was enslaved in fear 
under the dark shadow of death. But through the resurrection, we have shalom. We have peace. Peace comes to us through what Jesus has done, the work that he has done in overthrowing the grave. And therefore, we have rest from that fear. Again, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 2, I'll read also verse 15 this time, verses 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. He became humanity. He became a man, flesh and blood. And through death, or that through death, he might render powerless him who had the power over death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all all their lives. It is not God's will for you to be enslaved to fear, to be enslaved to doubt, to be enslaved to anxiety because he has conquered death in the grave through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have been delivered from the slavery to not just sin, but we have been delivered from the slavery to fear, from doubt, from anxiety. He sets us free by the power of his resurrection. Because of who Jesus is, we have been set free from the fear of death. As he declared to Martha in John chapter 11, when, she, when Lazarus, her brother, had died, and he said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asked, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? We come here not just this Sunday, but we come every Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not, it's not just once a year, but every Sunday, that's why we gather. Because if Jesus is not risen from the grave, then our faith is in vain. It's worthless. It means nothing. But we gather here today because Jesus is alive. Because he did die on the cross of Calvary. And he was in the grave for three days and three nights according to the prophecy of Jonah. But he is alive forever no more by the power of God. He has been set free and he has defeated death. He has declared us to be his children. And he has delivered us from the fear of death. Because whoever believes in him will never die. Oh sure, we'll experience a physical death. We'll shuck off this body and I say good riddance. This thing's messed up and it hurts most all the time. But I'm going to receive a glorified body. I'm going to receive an eternal body. I'm going to live forever in glory with him. Free from sin, free from pain, free from doubt and anxiety, free from the pressures of this world and knowing nothing but the presence and the power of Jesus. Let me ask you this morning, are you ready to rest in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Or are you still worried? Are you still running around to and fro in this world afraid of this and afraid of that? Or are you still anxious about things when the Lord has told you to not be anxious and not be fearful for He has overcome? Oh, in this life you'll have tribulation for sure. But our God has overcome, has overcome the world. And so we give him glory and praise this morning because he is the resurrected king. Because in his resurrection we have rest. I, I challenge you this morning, are you resting in the resurrection? Does it give you peace? Does it give you assurance? The reality that Jesus is alive forevermore. Those of us who rest in the resurrection this morning can celebrate. But there are those here who are not restful. There are those here who have not yet believed. I want to ask you this morning, do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus has risen from the grave? Because if you believe, that is the most significant event in human history and it changes everything and it will change you if you will believe it, if you will receive it, if you will accept it and allow Him to enter into your life to transform your soul, your heart, your mind, to rearrange your life in order with His will and His glory. Then you'll rest in the resurrection. I want to invite you this morning into that rest. I want to invite you this morning into that shalom, that peace, that assurance. 
There is power. Power. Wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb and His resurrection. Would you receive that resurrection power this morning? We're going to invite you to come. The altar will be open. There'll be here people, there'll be people praying. Many of them would be praying for a friend or a family member. They might be praying for you. But Brother Brian and I will be here near the front. Would you find one of us? And would you come this morning and say, I want that peace. I want that rest. Oh, that I might rest in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For some, it will be a declaration of salvation. Some of you need to receive the gift of salvation today. Others who have received that have forgotten how to rest in the resurrection. We'd love to pray with you. You come and you receive rest. Shalom. Peace in Christ Jesus, the risen Lord. Come as we stand.